on the upcoming edition of the Next Man Up podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Kenny Rhoda and I do a deep dive into the Cavaliers, specifically the resignation of John Beeline on Wednesday and who's to blame. We also talk Browns and Indians and the Indians specifically with the injuries, and we delve into the MLB cheating scandal. So uh, it's a packed show, and uh, buckle up. You should have some fun listening to it. Welcome to the latest edition of the Next Man Up podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm Dennis Maniloff. Alongside me is Kenny Rhoda, co-host, and producer extraordinaire Chase Smith. Roadman, we are going to talk about the potpourri of Cleveland sports, which means we'll cover the big three on the professional side in this town, Cavs, Indians, Browns. I wanted to start with the Cavaliers because of what happened on, what was it, Wednesday evening when the uh, official release came from Cavaliers headquarters that John Beeline had resigned and been reassigned to another uh, part of the organization. Beeline bowed out with a record of 14 and 40. Cavaliers, second worst record in the NBA, worst in the East, second only to Golden State overall. Roadman, when you heard that it was finally a fact because the rumors had been swirling for weeks and certainly once the all-star break hit, they were at a fever pitch. When you heard it was finally a fact, what went through your mind? Well, the first thing I remember is watching um, the all-star game Sunday night and then the uh, uh, the post-game show and everything and seeing the crawl come across the bottom of ESPN Sports Center. Cavs talking with Beeline about uh, stepping down. And I wasn't surprised by it, D-Man. There, there were a number of things that uh, I was keeping track of that I looked at and said, something's going on here. He ain't going to be back next year. I was surprised. Let me rephrase. I was surprised it happened this year. I figured it would happen at the end of the, the year. All right. I didn't think it would be 54 games in, all-star break done, and he doesn't come back. Because when, when you look at this, you know, nice guy, a lot of energy before the season started. And I wanted this to work, but 66-year-old dude who's never coached in the NBA before, he's going to bring his college system, uh, you know, to the pros. I was a little skeptical about whether or not it would work because you've got players that are younger than him making more money than him. The NBA is a different animal than college basketball. It's 82 games and the travel, three and four nights and all of that, and there's more pressure to win. And just the things that happened throughout the year from Tristan Thompson blowing up at him, Kevin Love with a couple of, uh, uh, you know, moments where he lost his, uh, you know, mind, went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs because, well, they were ignoring him, and I could understand why he would do that. Uh, then you had the, the thugs, slugs comment at the film session, D-Man, and then you lose by 41 at home. And there were, it was just connect the dots. Something's going to happen, and it was sooner rather than later. So this did not surprise me at all that John Beeline won't be back as the Cavaliers coach. I was just surprised it happened at the 54-game mark. I'm with you there, and I'll say this. I had a regularly scheduled Cavaliers at the All-Star break show uh, on WTAM 1100 on Wednesday night. And that schedule was put forth by the program director, Ray Davis, about a month in advance. So there's no you know, way we could have known that on that particular day, that Wednesday, uh, the, the Cavs were going to make it official. And literally two hours before I took the air, because they made it official in the 5 o'clock hour, and I was on the air in the uh, 7 o'clock hour. Right, And as I'm thinking about it, and we had a bunch of guests, you know, uh, John Michael, Jim Jones, Austin Carr, Angel Gray, Tim Alcorn, Campy Russell, they were all scheduled guests. And I asked every one of them, you know, this uh, different form of the same idea, the same question, what went wrong with this team? And the, most of the guests and even most of the callers in the four-hour show had sympathy for John Beeline. 
And even Campy Russell was saying he thought that Beeline was doing a heck of a job with the youngsters, and the youngsters were coming along pretty darn well. They were making progress, and you knew it was a rebuild, so you couldn't expect that many victories. And I thought to myself, you know, I think it's a little bit too sympathetic toward Beeline and too favorable toward Beeline. So toward the end of the show, I I was also checking Twitter and I saw some articles and columns that were written that John Beeline had done the noble thing by, by ejecting and that he was, you know, he should be applauded for recognizing that the NBA wasn't for him. And it kind of made my stomach turn even more. And at the end of the show, I said, there's an undeniable fact here. John Beeline quit on his team. Okay. He did not wait until the end of the season. He quit after 54 games. If a player had quit after 54 games or a player uh, had quit after 30 games, what would we call the player? We would call the player a quitter. It happened in the NFL. I can't remember the guy's name. It was at the Bills where he just flat out walked off the, the field for the last time, said, I'm done, right in the middle of the season. And he got he got ripped. And a lot of his colleagues said, hey, you know, you, you, you quit on your team. Well, I, I'm, I just was not sympathetic to John Beeline last night because I said he should have at least bucked up and finish the season because after all he's a he's in a five-year deal this was the first of five years he voluntarily signed it nobody held a gun to his head and said you have to coach the Cavaliers and you have to commit for five years so initially I was down on beeline and said he quit on his team before I tell you my revelation, I want to ask you, what do you think of my initial thought that Beeline quit on his team? See, I, I never really looked at it that way, D-Man, because of all the things I pointed out. And then the thing that put me over the top on this wasn't going to work was when they traded for Andre Drummond, or as Coach Luke likes to call him, one of the bigs, Andre Drummond's is, Right. They went out and they got a, a back-to-the-basket rebounding machine center in a game of three-point shooters now in the NBA, right? And in an offense that Beeline wants to run where the five is supposed to shoot the three. So when Kobe Altman traded for Andre Drummond, and I was on the conference call, and my question to him and my only question to him was, well, is this going to work in John Beeline's system? This this isn't what he's all about. And blah, 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 the spacing, blah, 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 the guards, blah, 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 Kobe Altman, right? And I'm listening to this, and I'm going, all right, this dude's done after this year. There's no way they're keeping Beeline after this year. They go out and they get a, a center like this based on, you know, his offense and 14 and uh, 40, a 41-point home loss, all that. So I, I figured he was done. And then I had known there were some rumblings inside the, the, the clubhouse, the locker room, whatever you want to call it. You know, the, the, I'm surprised he made it past the thug comment, even though he apologized. Um, so I, I wasn't ri ripping John Beeline. I figured it was a matter of time before it was going to happen. So the fact that it happened in season and he decided – to make the move as opposed to Dan Gilbert or Kobe firing him. The only thing that he loses out on is four years, $12 million, 14, 16, whatever it is. Uh, normally Gilbert fires you and you collect your money. In this case, he wanted out so bad, D-man. It must have been so bad. He's only getting paid for the end of this year as he's reassigned, and I expect him to be done at the end of this season. Uh, in, in yeah. whatever other role he has. Yeah, the reassignment undoubtedly will be breaking down uh, college prospect tape for the draft, and then once the draft is over, uh, Beeline is gone, and he will, if he wants to coach again, he'll coach at the college level. His days in the NBA are done as soon as he leaves his uh, reassignment position at the end of this uh, season or into the early summer 
He'll get hired at the college level like that. Texas yeah, and know. Mayfire, Shaka yeah. Smart, Texas will come yeah. calling. Other, you know, Power Five conference teams that are looking for a head coach, they'll they'll go look at him, and it's going to be up to him whether or not he wants to. I've got to believe he doesn't want to go out like this, that he'll probably coach again uh, for a little bit. That's just right. my, my gut feeling, my Butch Davis. Right, but here, here's what happened to me, though. I, I finished the show, and yeah. I come home, and I'm talking to my wife, Denise. You know Denise. Yep. You and Chase and all her. She's a very smart woman, and she's very piped into sports and very observant. And, you know, she always is supportive of me and, and will generally agree with what I say, uh, what I've said on the air. But in this case, she said, you know what? I think you got this wrong. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, I, I think that you need to take a, a harder look at exactly why John Beeline hit the eject button. And instead of calling him a quitter, or at least quitting on his team, why don't you look at the players themselves and the culture in Cleveland, as in the, the Cavaliers' culture? And I said, hmm, okay. So deep into the night last night and then this afternoon, I did a lot of research, a lot of reading, uh, and, and watching and listening. And, of course, I heard Charles Barkley uh, lay into the Cavaliers players for essentially getting John Beeline fired. That was the term that uh, Shaq and, and, and Kenny the Jet and Barkley used as opposed to uh, resigning. Um, you know, Barkley was saying the players basically got Beeline out of there. And the more I had read and the more I had listened and the more I had researched, I agreed with my wife and I said, you know what? The players bear the brunt of this for many reasons, including when you hear that they didn't want to work on fundamentals. They were tired of the film sessions. They were tired of the, uh, the perfectionist attitude that Beeline had. Now, granted, as you said, the thugs and slugs mishap for Beeline easily was fireable in today's game. So I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying I did a 180 and I, all I'm doing is, is ripping the players and defending Beeline. Beeline has culpability here, but I've changed my tune in that I think that there is a lot of validity to number one, Players not uh, listening to their coach and being unprofessional in their attitude toward their coach, no matter who it is, you need to respond to the guy who was hired to be the coach, whether you like it or not. And he, if you didn't like it, then you still got to suck up and be professional about it. And unfortunately, in the Cavaliers, locker room it seems that two of the least professional were the two guys that i'm sure john beeline thought he could count on kevin love and tristan thompson now again i can only go by what i've read heard and gleaned from reports and anonymous sources that love and thompson were no friend to john beeline and what a shame that is that the two guys who have the ring from 16, the two veterans are not helping out the coach and not trying to be leaders to at least say, Hey, this is how we're going to do it. Whether we like it or not, we're going to be professional under the leadership of the coach that has, you know, the employment next to his name. Now, when you look at love and Thompson, then you say to yourself, their holdovers from the, the glory days of LeBron James. And you say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Oh, that's right. The coach killing is continuing. Even when LeBron is gone, the culture that LeBron brought to Cleveland, yes, he brought a championship. Yes, he did. The greatest years that we've ever had as Cavaliers fans were when LeBron was here. Unfortunately, a residual effect of LeBron was this attitude toward the coaches that if you don't like them, you don't have to respect them 
and you can undermine them and you can undercut them until they're gone. And you think about LeBron's legacy his first time around in Cleveland. Then you think about how, how he treated Spolstra and Pat Riley when he was in Miami. Then he comes back here and he can't stand David Blatt from the jump. And he gets his way with Ty Lu. And then Lou eventually gets undercut after LeBron is gone, of course. But here comes Larry Drew. And Larry Drew was fed up with a lot of the shenanigans that were going on in the locker room. And now this season, you have John Beeline, who's disrespected and replaced by Bickerstaff, who's supposedly going to be respected because he's an NBA guy and he's, he's been an NBA coach and whatnot. So there, I think now that I've thought it over for 24 hours, there's something to be said about a culture in Cavaliers land that disrespects coaches whom you don't like. Now tell me, am I right or wrong on that? I think there's something to what you're saying, D-Man. I, I do. But I also think Kevin Love, maybe early in the season, gave it a shot. And you remember when he blew up? And, and we all saw it. He was wide open in, in the low post. And, and, you know, they didn't get him the basketball. And I'm sitting there. They start four and five. And we're like, oh, okay, nine games in. Hey, they're moving the ball. This is working. Then all of a sudden it stopped working. And – I think this was just a bad marriage all the way around. Beeline wasn't ready for the NBA. Uh, the players probably didn't treat him fairly or respect him. And after the thugs comment you read, I think it was in The Athletic, the report was some of the players were turning up the stereo with songs that had the word thugs in it or a group of Bone Thugs and Harmony or whatever, you know, making fun of them. Now, Beeline may not have even realized it, you know, but so – yeah, this was just bad all the way around. And then I heard Kevin Love today talking about, uh, you know, how much respect he had for John Beeline because Beeline came in and opened up and talked to all the players. So you, there are so many different layers to this Cavaliers mess this season. I don't know what percentage of blame I need to put on Kobe Altman, on – John Beeline, on Kevin Love, on Colin Sexton, on the players, on the rest of the front office. Dan Gilbert, unfortunately, has not been healthy during this time. He's recovering from a stroke, so he's not as hands-on as he normally was. Um, so it's just been an absolute disaster from the get-go. And while it may not let – D-Man, we can go back to, to Magic Johnson getting Paul Westhead fired because he didn't like Westhead and his style of offense, and they brought in Pat Riley, and then they go on to be Showtime and win it. This isn't new in the NBA. This has been going on from the, the you know the the early '80s, and LeBron's not the only one who has you know can wield that power of getting a coach canned. Other players can as well. And so this, this the John Beeline thing, like I said, there's just so many different reasons why this didn't work. And blame needs to be spread out through all of those areas. Yeah, and you could even blame Gilbert before he was stricken because he desperately wanted to get a college coach in right. here, preferably from Michigan. As we know, he had tried for Bizzo repeatedly, and he winds up with Beeline. So you wonder why did he feel like he had to scratch that itch to bring in the, the superstar college coach uh, to to try to win in the NBA with no head coaching or assistant coaching experience. But I do want to say this, though. If the theory is right that – or if there's some credence to the idea that there still is a culture of uh, disrespect toward coaches you may, uh, may not agree with or may not like in Cleveland, I would say to those who are here – who disrespected Beeline to the extent that they did. Hey, LeBron can do it because you know what he delivers? He delivers wins. Yeah. And he delivers championships and finals appearances. He, you know what? If that's what comes with LeBron, it's unfortunate. But guess what? In LeBron 
It was four seasons, four finals, and one title. Okay. Right. You guys in 1920 playing for the Cavaliers, a lot of you holding over from the 1819 sad sacks that I think won 19 games. You haven't won bupkis. You haven't won anything. Or as, as AD as, likes to say, they have won a do this squat. Yeah. Right? Because I they mean, haven't. Well, obviously, Thompson and Love can say, well, we're, we're champions. Well, guess what? Yeah. Uh, Thompson and Love, you wouldn't have been champs without the King. All right. So you don't have the right. None of the people on this roster at this time, this current crew has a right to act high and mighty because they haven't really done anything other than Love and Thompson needing uh, LeBron to carry them to a title. Right. But here's the thing about Love, though. You've heard me say this when it wasn't fashionable. And I got hit for it on Twitter. And some people who, some of the people who've listened to our pod have gotten after me. Oh, you don't, you, why are you after love? Why do you, I called love a phony from the jump. Okay. You people that are clinging to this idea that Kevin Love is some wonderful guy and he's Larry Bird reincarnated and he's such an amazing player. He's not. No, no. I called him when he was with Le when he was with LBJ and KI. It wasn't the big three. It was the big two and a half. Kevin Love was the half. You see what Love does when he's supposed to be the leader. He's not a leader. Okay. He's a undercutter when it when it suits him. He's barely available on a regular basis to play anyway. How can you lead when you're constantly out of the lineup? But so this idea, oh, Kevin Love, you, how dare you take on Kevin Love? Oh, I'll tell you why. Because he's a phony. That's why. He's a phony star. This idea that Kevin Love is some great player? Really? When, when have you seen greatness from Kevin Love absent LeBron James? Kenny, when? Well, when he was in Minnesota, if you're going by numbers, he put up big numbers and was an all-star For all garbage there. teams. I, I, well, I He's understand. He's a stat stuffer on trash teams. I'm just saying, though. Um, and, and the other thing that you have to take into consideration is that LeBron wanted him on the team. So LeBron's got a pretty good basketball IQ, and yeah. he knew. And he knew right away that he, he regretted it. You well, not necessarily regretted it. But I mean, he he was a good third wheel, and, and here's the and I'll you know I'll defend Kevin Love from this standpoint, D man. I'm not a huge Kevin Love fan, and you're right, he's fragile. So is Kyrie Irving. Look, he's out for the rest of the season with shoulder surgery again today, right? So Kevin Love's a little fragile. But you know, Kevin, maybe the lack of leadership has something to do with his anxiety and his depression that he's come out and talked about, and he maybe has made a bigger impact off the court than he has on the court by being, you know, one of the voices to come out and say, hey, go get help. I just read an article about Ben Gordon who tried to kill himself and was dealing with bipolar. Uh, roll, and man, roll, man, roll, whoa, man. whoa, whoa, whoa. Time yeah. out. No, 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 Now you make me seem like I'm inhumane and I'm some – horrible person because I'm dare to criticize a guy oh, who can criticize him with his mental issues. I, I don't even want to talk about that part of it. I'm, but I'm, I'm saying I'm that might have affected the court. That might have affected him on the court that, you know, having to deal with that, the anxiety of all of a sudden you're right. He was a stat stuffer on a shitty team in Minnesota. Okay. Let's just call it like it is. And he comes to Cleveland and all of a sudden he's expected to be Chris Bosh to Dwayne Wade and LeBron James, or in this case, Kyrie Irving uh, and LeBron James. And maybe he couldn't handle that because of his off the you know court issues and it affected his play. I don't know. Um, he's fragile. He's injured. But in fairness to him, Kelly Olynyk pulled his, his arm out of his socket. That wasn't Kevin Love just falling down, getting a bruise, and he's out. The guy yanked. He went to Ronda Rousey with the arm bar and yanked it out of his socket. So I, there's there's a part of me that will defend Kevin Love, and there's a part of me that will say you're right about a, a stat stuffer in Minnesota and never really 
reached superstar status status in Cleveland, maybe all-star status in Cleveland. And I think the one time uh, maybe he was an all-star, or maybe it's twice, but one of the two times, whatever it was, he was hurt and he couldn't play in the all-star game, right? I, so I, I, I see where you're coming from with Kevin, but I'm going to give him a little leeway uh, as uh, I'm reading more about all these other things that, that are happening with athletes and how they handle pressure or don't handle pressure. Well, again, I try to treat it as a separate issue. You're saying it, it, it blends into his yes, play. Okay. I think it does. All right. Well, that's me. I don't have any right. proof. That's hey, just my opinion. Hey, no, then let me apologize to Kevin Love if in any way my criticisms seem to uh, diminish what he has gone public with on the mental side of things. I am not by any way, shape, or form uh, trying to diminish it or demean it. I'm simply okay. trying to look at one of, if not the most overpaid player in the NBA. Okay? Oh, right now? At I, don't know, yeah. I don't know how in the world you can justify a $30 million contract with this guy. And by but the do way, you blame him? Do you blame no, him or do you blame the guy that paid him it? No, I don't blame him, Kenny, but I'll tell you what I do blame him on, though. What? Once you grab that cash, when you when the Cavs are dumb enough to dump the truck it in front of your in, in front of your face, uh, you got to recognize you're lucky to have that money. Your odds are no other team is going to overpay for you like the Cavs did. So when you willingly, voluntarily sign on the dotted line. For a guaranteed, what is it, four years or five, four plus an option, whatever the hell it was, over $120 million, you got to realize, hey, I might not have things go my way the whole time I'm here, but I got to suck it up and be a professional because, after all, I'm getting paid $30 million to do this. And instead, you got love by his own admission, and he didn't invoke the mental illness thing when he said I was a 31 year old acting like a 13 year old when he yep. had the infamous blow up on the court and who knows what other crap he was pulling that we didn't hear about but he flat out said I was acting like a 13 year old well that's great Kevin thanks a lot buddy really appreciate that we're paying you 29 30 million bucks to be a leader with a bunch of young guys with a coach who's trying to learn the NBA, and all you're doing is throwing hissy fits on the court and probably undercutting the coach behind the scenes, and we're supposed to go, oh, yeah, Kevin, you're the man. No, you're not the man. And then he has the audacity to come out. Was it yesterday after Beeline gave his emotional plea? Oh, it takes a real man to say what he said. Well, gee, Kevin, did you ever stop to think that maybe you're one of the reasons he quit after 54 games? But now you're going to sit there and go, oh, I have so much admiration for this man. He's such a professional. Oh, shut the hell up, love. How about you do me a favor, Kevin? The last 28 games, how about you play every freaking game? Play the final 28, give me 24 and 12 for Bickerstaff and shut your mouth. How about that? Okay. But so, no, you, you know what it's going to be. He's going to put this all on him. No, are you I'm this just all saying on Kevin he's Lark? part of the problem. He's I mean, part of the problem. You know, Tristan Thompson, we heard, you know, things well, about Tristan Thompson as a I'm better. Not, I but said then we he's heard part Colin of the Justin problem too, uh, you know, with his comments. So I said but, he's part of the problem, not D the only problem. D I, I just think. That. It's I think it's ridiculous that the highest paid player on the team is is as unreliable and unprofessional as Kevin Love. He's played That's 46 all. he's played 46 of the 54 games this year. Hey, all right. Yeah, what huh? what percentage saying? is that now? Uh, is he uh, up uh, over 85%, is that right? 46 of 54, Chase do the math. I'm well, just saying it's not all Kevin Love. This was no, this, but, this is let me just finish. I went back and did the numbers. Without LeBron James, okay, when he left in 2010, D-Man, okay, he comes back four years, and now he's been gone too. So you take those years when he was gone the first time and now that he's gone. 
You know what the Cavs' winning percentage is without LeBron James? And this goes back. This makes the front office look terrible and the owner look terrible. Without LeBron James, they've won at a 29% clip. 290, and I rounded up to make it 290, okay? So without LeBron James, that front office that had three first overall picks, okay? That ownership, that front office, three first overall picks, they weren't making the playoffs without LeBron James. Kyrie wasn't taking them to the playoffs. The most they won with him was 33 games. The only way they got back to the playoffs was that LeBron James came here, and you added Kevin Love to Kyrie Irving. And that trio, or two and a half, or two and a half men, uh, starring Charlie Sheen, Kevin Love, and whoever else, right? So um, it, it took that group to win a championship. And, and D-Man, I'm going to say this. If he doesn't get hurt, they beat the Warriors in that first year, in my opinion. We'll never know. Can't prove it. Can't play that game out. But I think if Kevin Love or Kyrie Irving stays healthy, the Warriors – get beat that first year by the Cavaliers, and the Cavaliers have two championships. Now, would that have made a difference? Maybe. Okay, maybe it does in the way you look at him. But I understand where you're – he's averaging 17, 7, and 10 rebounds. So he's averaging a double-double on a crappy team, and he's shooting 13 shots a game. Now, whose fault is that if he's only shooting 13 shots a game, D-Man? Is that Kevin Love's? Or is that the coach who should have been running the offense through Kevin Love instead of putting the ball in Colin Sexton's hand and, and letting him do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants? Uh, fair enough. I, I, you know, he should be shooting the ball more. I, like I said, I, I, I want to see Kevin Love play the remainder of the season. I'll give him two off days for load maintenance. Uh, or for load management. So I want 26 of the last 28 games. All right. I want a 2010. I'll, I'll dial it back to 2010 because you have Drummond now and you still have Thompson and, and Nance Jr. and the young guys in the backcourt. So give me a 20, a 20 and 10 average for 26 out of the 28 games and keep your comments to a minimum and, and earn your money for once. But I'll say this, though. As you said, and I agree, it's not just love. I'm using him because he's a veteran who gets paid almost $30 million. But what I say to all of these guys, okay, first of all, blame should be spread everywhere, as you as you uh, earlier articulated. Dan Gilbert, uh, for some reason, had to get that Michigan college coach. Well, guess what? Uh, you're trying to break in a guy who's in his late 60s, never had been a head coach or an assistant at the NBA level. It's a different world, and you thought that you could do it. So that's a mistake. Um, you know, if this had been Jimmy Haslam, a uh, Jimmy Haslam hire, oh, I don't know, Jimmy Haslam hiring Freddie Kitchens, what happens? Jimmy Haslam gets ripped for it. Well, Dan Gilbert, as the owner, should be ripped for this hire because it blew up. Uh, Kobe Altman, general manager, has got to take some of the blame, although I doubt – very seriously, that Kobe Altman was pounding the table for John Beeline. Well, I, he he what was, I read, though, what I read, Mike Gansey played for for Beeline at West Virginia. Remember that Kobe yeah. Altman met Beeline through Gansey at a wedding, and they became good friends. So that right. there was, you know, okay. some some connection there between the the GM and the assistant GM, and, and with Dan's okay. you know health and everything. I, I'm just throwing it out there. No, that's fair. And it, but I was going to blame Altman. Any he gets a share. Even yeah, if he didn't sure. pound the table, but maybe he really did like Beeline. So he gets it. John Beeline, let me make this clear. Those who just heard me get after love. John Beeline deserves a portion of the blame. Last night I said in the majority of the blame, I've dialed it back. But there's still blame to be assessed to John Beeline. He flat out crapped out as an NBA head coach. It didn't work. And he's part of the problem. You yeah. can't you can't absolve this guy of blame just because he's a professional or just because he's a good man. No, he came in and he blew it. I mean, Freddie Kitchens gets ripped for his one year at six and ten. You can't sit there and go, well, John Beeline, uh, you know, he had so many factors working against him. That's why he went uh, fourteen and forty. Listen, you are what your record says you are, John. And you were 14 and 40, and you tapped out. So I blame Beeline as well as the others, including the players. Not just Love, not just Thompson, 
But the young guys, I'm blaming the players for uh, lack of attention to detail, lack of professionalism, lack of respect to the coach, lack of on-court production, uh, cluelessness on defense, uh, <laughs> uh, not understanding the passing game and the cutting game, not even wanting to seemingly understand it. Um, whether John Beeline was was a foreigner to the NBA or not, the bottom line is the team, the players on the court looked like crap and were getting blown out on an, a semi-nightly basis and, you know, were horrible in the third quarter. It's not all the coach's fault. The players need to look in the mirror and say, you know what? We stunk. We were embarrassing. Yes. We are embarrassing at 14 and 40. And just because we got rid of John Beeline, that's not going to automatically mean that we're going to suddenly be respectable. We have to work at it. We have to actually pay attention to in meetings, and we have to listen to our coaching staff, and we have to play as five on a string on defense, and, and you know, and and actually pass and cut and think about offensive sets. We can't just go out there and stuff the stat sheet for our own individual uh, accolades. So the blame goes all over the place. The only people I don't blame in this whole mess are the fans. The, the Cavs fans got a, another raw deal. They got another coach blow up in their face. By the way, the Cavaliers, I don't know of any other professional team. I can't think of one yeah. that's pulled this uh, perfecta <laughs> off. Back-to-back -back seasons, yeah. you have made a coaching change in season. Right. Don't forget. T. Lou, 0-6 to open last season yep. and was replaced by Larry, don't call me interim, Drew. So the Cavaliers, two years in a row, in-season coaching change. That, that, that's ridiculous. So D-Man, four fans, coaches in two years. Yeah. Think the it, fans, I mean, the, the fans, Browns haven't even done that. No, the fans get a raw deal in this. I don't blame the fans one bit. In fact, I feel terrible for those fans who have paid money to go watch this this clown show and watch these guys get embarrassed. And I'll say this, here's an ironic part of it. And yes, I'm using the word correctly when so many people use it incorrectly. The irony of the end of the Beeline era is he walked off on a victory in one of the more impressive games I've seen the Cavs play in a long time. They, when they beat the Hawks at home to end that long home losing streak, the sec, I think it was the second game with uh, with uh, Drummond, Drummond yep. and, and they actually looked like a professional basketball team. Now, admittedly, they beat a terrible Hawks team. I, I grant you that. But I think it was a, they scored 127 points. Yep. And while we knew that Beeline had been frustrated with so many things, and we figured that the rumor mill was going to heat up in the uh, during over that long All Star break. You wondered if maybe, just maybe, Beeline would reconsider uh, tapping out after what he saw in the Atlanta game and say, you know what, I'll, I'll at least give it a shot with this crew for the remaining twenty eight. But what you had raised earlier is a solid question, at least to ask. I'm not saying I know this. I don't have any sourcing on it, but I'm I'm wondering, did John Beeline hope in the sanctity of his own private thoughts that either Kevin Love or Tristan Thompson was going to be moved at the trade deadline? And not only were Thompson and Love not moved, but he had Drummond put on top of his head. That's the one. Drummond, yeah. As you said, is not a John Beeline type of player. That doesn't mean I'm knocking Drummond. I don't know him. I've only seen him in a Cavs uniform for, you know, barely a couple of weeks here and barely a couple of games. So I have nothing negative to say about Drummond as a Cavalier. I'm simply saying that if you're going to add somebody for John Beeline to work with who's an active NBA player, Ja uh, Andre Drummond would be way down the list. So not only did 
Love and Thompson remain Cavaliers, but Drummond gets added, and you wonder if that was the final straw for Beeline, and he's just like, look, this is not going to work for me the remainder of the way. You might as well get Bickerstaff going with this crew because he is going to be the coach going forward. He was the hand-picked successor, so I'll give him a 28-game head start into next season. Yeah, when that happened, that's you know that's when I said this this is going to be one and done for for Beeline and Bickerstaff was the Tyron Lue to David Blatt, right? Uh, Bickerstaff was the um, Larry Drew to Tyron Lue. At least they had a successor, uh, you know, in mind if it, it didn't work out well, and obviously it hasn't. Uh, but again, maybe we don't blame John Beeline. Maybe we blame who hired John Beeline, right? It's like with the Browns. Do you really blame the general manager when Jimmy Haslam hired the general manager? So not knowing for sure who had final say on Beeline, was it Gilbert or was it, uh, you know, Kobe Altman and Mike Gansey? Don't know, but that's where maybe the blame goes because, like I said at the beginning of this podcast here, to me, when I saw that, here's a lifer. He's a lifetime college coach. No NBA experience whatsoever. Sound familiar, Freddie Kitchens? No NFL head coaching experience, you know, whatsoever. And and I just was curious to see if that style, pass the ball five times, run on the picket fence, don't get caught, watching the paint dry, you know, the Hoosier stuff. It, it, these are professional athletes. These are guys with egos. These are guys that make more money than you. These guys will be there longer. Then, then the coach will be, and we're seeing that. So I, I just think the NBA – D-Man, I, I was looking this up. Can you name me one college coach, one college coach that made the jump to the NBA and had great success, including a championship? Uh, no. In fact, uh, Roadman, I'll give you my list of uh, my ignominious six – my ignominious six. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's the list that Beeline just made number six. You have Jerry Tarkany and Rick Pitino, yeah. uh, John Calipari, Lon Kruger, John Beeline, and uh, one other dude who were all 600 plus victories at the college level and were largely busts in the NBA. Exactly. Like Calipari, so, Did you John say Calipari? Calipari. Yeah, yeah, John Calipari. Cal- Calipari, Thanks, Calipari, Patino, and and Tark, Kruger, yep. Beeline, and somebody else. I, Tim, I'm blank, with Tim Floyd. I'm blanking maybe? on uh, no, it's not Floyd. Uh, but they're on the 600 win club, okay. and you know Beeline, of course, is in the 700s. And all six of those guys struggled mightily yeah. at the professional level. Yeah. And here was the thing. I did this research for the show last night on WTAM. I couldn't find a member of the 600 win club who's done anything uh, with any sustained success at All right. the NBA level. Here, so here, that, that's the your name. point. Yeah. Here's the one name, and I don't know how many career college wins he has. I know he has over 1,000 career NBA wins and a championship. Larry Brown. Yeah, I look Larry, Larry Brown. Yeah. UCLA, Larry, Kansas, he won yeah. with Danny Manning. They won the championship. And Brown he, did not coach as long in the college ranks as we think he did, so he didn't get a chance to amass uh, that many victories. I think he's in the 200s. But uh, he's the one that yeah, won a championship yeah. at the collegiate level, went to the pros, and actually, well, he was in the ABA first, then college, then the NBA, and he bounced around. Uh, he got out before, you know, teams fired him and went to Philadelphia, took Allen Iverson to the finals the one year. He was with Detroit when they won the title the one year with, uh, I think, Billups and those guys. So he's the one coach. And the reason I bring this up, if you know that, if analytics is a part of all sports, if these numbers are there staring you in the face, why do you go hire a college coach? Yeah, yeah, fair I mean, enough. Doesn't make sense, yeah. right? I mean, it, it, there, there's one guy. Brad Stevens has had some success with the Celtics, but he hadn't won a, a, an Eastern Conference championship. He hadn't been to the finals, right? He hadn't won a title. He, he's the only other one recently that's had some success. And now even in Boston, they're wondering, oh, where, you know, where's the magic with Brad Stevens? So when they hired the college coach, I just look at it and I, man, there's, there, there's a difference. 
whatever that difference is, it, it affects you as a coach at the collegiate level versus the NBA level. And maybe that's why Bickerstaff is better suited for this team, having been an interim head coach in the NBA one time and a, a full-time head coach once before. And he was the insurance policy for John Beeline, and they're cashing that in now starting tomorrow. Yeah, and uh, Chris Fedor, the great uh, Cavs beat reporter for Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer, he said that there is going to be no uh, coaching search in the offseason. Bickerstaff is the guy going forward. He, not only is he not an interim, he's the coach uh, going forward. They're not even going to look to replace him. So um, hopefully that the players have gotten what they wanted. They, they got Bickerstaff in there. And, um, you know, the players, hey, man, let me ask you this. what if it works? What if, it, what if they go 15 and 13 in the final 28 games and it was the coach, will you change your well, tune on blaming the players? I'm not saying it will. I'm just yeah. saying, what if it does work? What if this needed to be done? Well, that's a tough one, Kenny, because let's say they do well. You can look at it two ways. You could say, well, obviously Beeline was holding them back. Or you could say they were tanking, if you will, for Beeline. They were not, they were purposely underperforming while Beeline was here. And therefore, that's inexcusable and unprofessional. So, I mean, but I, I get what you're saying, but I think you, depending on what side, of the fence you want to be on, you can say, all right, if they play well down the stretch, it was clearly beeline. Or if you're pro beeline, you can say they're playing well down the stretch. This is what they were capable of doing with John beeline. If they just cared enough and if they were professional enough to do it, but they didn't want to because they didn't want him around. So um, I, I could see it both ways. If they play well, I'll say this, though. If I were one of those players, young or old, I look in the mirror and I go, you know what? I'm going to take response, my my share of responsibility for what happened. And I'm going to be better for it from this day forward. I'm going to be a professional. I'm going to show up for every meeting. I'm going to leave, get there early and leave late. I'm going to practice the fundamentals. I'm going to listen to my coach. I'm going to bust my ass on both ends of the court. I'm going to communicate on defense. I'm going to pass on offense. Uh, you know, I don't care what player you are. The, to me, the Cavaliers need to look at this and what transpired and say, no matter how you slice up the blame, some of it's got to fall on us, yeah. and we need to be better. We need to be more professional. What we have done to this point is embarrassing. Because it's not just 14 and 40, it's 14 and 40 with a bunch of horrendous losses. It's the way they've been beat. I mean, you hear AC, Austin Carr, you know, he he's not one to hold back. He's like, hey, at some point, you have to get tired of being clowned by the other team. Uh, you mentioned the Golden State loss, the worst home loss in, in the history of the franchise. Well, no, that wasn't the worst. The worst one was the L.A. Clippers. That I'm was sorry. the 41-point loss. Yeah. But, right. but to your point, Golden State, who has the worst record in the yeah. league, on the road in Cleveland, still beat the Cavaliers by 19 points. Yeah, and it could have been 30. I mean, they yeah. were clowning sure. them. They were clowning them late. And, and at some point, your professional pride has to kick in. And as a young player, old player, I don't care what your age level or veteran, veteran, rookie, whatever, you have to say, this can't stand. We can't be pushed around and, and made fun of to yeah. this extent. Uh, even, even though we're getting paid, we, we need to be humiliated here. This is terrible. So anyway, all right. So we, we wrap up the calves and, uh, uh, you know, we wish Bickerstaff the best. We'll see what happens down the road here. Washington, Friday night in yeah. D.C. That's the first of listen, his 28-game run. Listen, it wouldn't surprise me if they come out with their hair on fire, okay? Yeah, we'll I, get, I get that Washington is going to be at home, and they've had just as much rest as Cleveland. I don't think Washington's playing tonight. Uh, but, uh, you know, it wouldn't shock me at all if Cleveland went in there and beat them because – Earlier in the year, you referenced the four and five. 
they were four and five on a two game winning streak. One of which was a game in Washington yep. when they punked the wizards. And then they were playing Philly in Philly and should have beat them, beaten them. They were leading them by six, I think with a minute to go lost that by one instead of being five and five, they were four and six. And you know, it's pretty much been uh, a disaster ever since. All right, we move uh, to the Browns quickly. Anything happening with the Browns road, man, that has <laughs> caught your eye? I, I say that uh, with a wink and a nod because I know things have caught your eye and your ear. Uh, Here's what I'll say. All right, I'll, I'll just say this. I have a bad hip. I have an impingement. I need surgery. I know what my injury is. I'm not a professional athlete. I can still get around and do the things I want to do. But if I wanted to, you know, run a marathon or, or get back into, you know, um, being a weekend warrior, I would have to have surgery replacement and, and get it all taken care of. So I know what a hip injury is all about. Time out. Time out. Time out. Mike Montgomery. That's the sixth guy. Oh, there you go. Yeah, from Stanford. Very good. Okay, uh, with the coaches. All right, so when IT, Isaiah Thomas, came here with the impingement and hip injury, and Jarvis Landry said he had one at the end of the season, I called it. You can ask my partner, JT, on the Kenny and JT Show, whbc.com. Uh, I said, look, these guys aren't going to get better unless they have surgery. They have to have surgery. It's not going away. You can't just rehab this. And when I heard Jarvis Landry at the end of the year, when he was going to the Pro Bowl and he was at LSU's championship game, said, oh, I don't need surgery. I'm just shaking my head. And I told JT, I said, he's going to have surgery at some point. He had surgery February 4th. So your two-star receivers, OBJ, core muscle, or sports hernia, whatever you want to call it, surgery, and now Jarvis Landry hip surgery. Both are supposed to be ready for training camp. We'll see. If I'm Stefanski, if I'm Van Pelt, if I'm Baker Mayfield, I'm concerned about that because these are injuries. The core injury, a lot easier to come back from than the hip injury. I'm concerned about both those guys going into camp. You can't see me, but I'm giving you a standing all road, man. Can't see me on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for identifying this. Why in the world... When OBJ was talking about all these problems that he was having in the lower, the, to quote the NHL, the lower body region, yeah. why in the he heck wasn't that fixed right then and there? Yeah. You didn't need him to play 16 games. You didn't need him to make those that amazing catch in the, against the Bengals in a meaningless game. You didn't need him to go over 1,000 yards. You needed him for 2020. But Shut deep. that dude down and get the surgery. I but agree no. with you. But he didn't want to be known as, oh, there he is again, missing games in a season. So he supposedly played through the oh. pain. But I'm with you. No. It's about we can't win this year. More important things next year. Be healthy for when OTA start and training camp. Now, maybe he still will be healthy. We'll see. Kareem Hunt came back and didn't have any issues, you know, after eight games. And he had it in but, August. So but we'll Roman, see. Even, but even beyond OBJ is Landry. Yeah. As now you that said, one. Landry's talking about a hip problem at the end of the season. You say, all right, so even if I give OBJ and Landry credit for gutting it out the entire season, I can't even imagine how hard it is to play the NFL, let alone the NFL hurt. But they both get through. Please, OBJ, get that surgery done within five days of the end of the season. Yep. Same with you, Landry. But at least in the case of OBJ, he didn't go to the Pro Bowl and take part in whatever the hell they took part in. And the idea that Landry was saying, well, I needed the Pro Bowl to convince me that I needed this hip surgery. What? Yeah. Like that's your rationale for getting hip surgery? Oh, thank God for the Pro Bowl to enlighten me to get hip surgery. No. As soon as those words came out of your mouth during this end of the, you know, at near the end of the season, that's when you need to say, I got to get hip surgery. And like yep. you said, Roadman, why, why are we dragging it out beyond the Pro Bowl and then saying, 
oh, that's it. The Pro Bowl convinced me I got to have hip surgery. Yeah, it's you, waste, you know what? You wasted time there. It was meaningless. Why did you waste the time? That that I, I when I heard it, I I knew it had to happen eventually, and it did later rather than sooner, which ends up hurting the Browns in the long run. And think about this: you, you got those two guys, then you have two Browns getting stopped by the cops. First, it was Kareem Hunt, and he gets pulled over, and everybody heard the the audio tape of that, and they found a little bit of weed in his car that supposedly wasn't his. Well, you know who's happy today? Kareem Hunt. You want to know why? Because Greg Robinson took oh, no. all the pressure off of Kareem Hunt because Greg Robinson got busted with me. Allegedly. He got busted allegedly with me. And when I say me, 157 pounds of marijuana in his car with two other dudes trying to cross the Texas-Mexican border. And he's facing 20 years in prison, possibly, if convicted on this. And so Kareem Hunt's like, whew, I'm all good, man. Nothing, nothing to worry about now. Everybody forgot about me. 150 now. Granted, he's not coming back. The Browns supposedly were not bringing Greg Robinson back, but it's still a black eye for the Browns when, when two of your players from last year both got pulled over by the cops, yeah. one with a little bit of weed and the other with 157 pounds of weed. Yeah, the, the Browns are saying, why couldn't you wait until free agency started yeah. and we could release you or you could become a free agent? You wouldn't have Browns next to your name, Greg Robinson, but – Again, everybody's innocent until proven guilty. Right. Yeah. The fact of the matter with Kareem Hunt is he was only popped for speeding. Right. As far as we know, that's as far as it's going to go, although I do think still it's interesting that the NFL has not acted on the quote from the back of the cruiser in which Hunt admitted that to the cop that he would have failed an NFL-administered drug test. Yeah. I would have thought that would have sent off alarm bells on Park Avenue and that maybe Hunt was going to face some discipline for that comment. Because remember, players, if they get in front of the microphone or off-season or in-season or off-season and say something derogatory toward the league, they face punishment, you know, usually in the form of a fine. So I'm curious as to why the NFL has not at least uh, slapped uh, Hunt on the wrist for that comment, not, you know, not suspending them, but at least saying, okay, uh, we're going to fine you because you admitted that you were going to flunk a drug test if we had been on the scene. Well, to me, that's a suspension, not more than a a fine. You know, maybe we'll see that with with Roger Goodell because he was walking that fine line to begin with. He had to stay on the straight and narrow. That's a tricky one. And and I, I, for Browns fans' sake, I hope that, Everything works out. I hope that Kareem Hunt, this was his his final wake up call, if you will, and that there, you know, that he realized how close he was to having it all uh, flushed away. We know if that policeman had been a red ass, let's yeah. say, yeah. and maybe not been a Browns fan, it could have gone differently in, in that uh, on that stop. Um, but I, I think that quote is a self inflicted problem for Kareem Hunt because he. He certainly didn't have to say it, you right. know. When when the when the policeman was leading him there, he didn't have to go there. He could have said, "Hey, I, I you know, I, I would have been fine, and no, no big deal." But and obviously, the players' union would would jump the hunt's defense, and they would say, "There's no way that the NFL can litigate a punishment when all you're going off of is a quote in a cruiser, and you never right. tested them. No but blood the point, work, no. But nothing, it's yeah. it's bad optics and it's bad audio, and and hunt." Hunt should know better, especially given the fact that he's on thin ice to begin with. In the matter of Robinson, I mean, he what he's he's not going to be a Brown very long. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a matter of days. Um, it's it's terribly unfortunate what's happened. Uh, you know, for him and his family. Uh, obviously, you know, again, innocent until proven guilty. But it doesn't look good. It certainly doesn't <laughs> look good. Uh, I I can't even believe some of the numbers. The, the 157 is a number that's burned into people's brains. Um, so, you know, even when the Browns are – even when Browns are getting ready to go out the door, <laughs> they're still making news, and Berea gets dragged back into uh, the cesspool and the toxic environment. So there's always something crazy happening with a member of the Browns. 
Uh, you know, so I, I don't know. All I know is this. Not that they were going to bring him back, but they need a pair, not one, they need two yeah. uh, tackles and preferably one in the draft and one in free agency in order to help Baker Mayfield stand upright in, in year three. They need two tackles, and the Indians need starting pitching, D-man. Mike Clevenger down yeah. six to eight weeks after meniscus surgery. Uh, Carlos Carrasco, we're waiting to get the MRI results back from his leg injury. He was walking around with a crutch or a cane or something uh, in the clubhouse. JT and I leave Sunday morning. We're going to Arizona for a week. So we're going to be down there. So we're going to be in the thick of things like this. And we we're just wondering. Bring your gonna... magic dust and your yeah. faith healing and your – Top hat and everything else. Yeah, bring the elixir, uh, you know, whatever it is. To Go try boo, and some, some rum. <laughs> get some rum in there. Hell yeah. You know, so we're going to see who's still standing by the time we get there uh, Sunday night and broadcast live Monday afternoon on 1480 WHBC. But uh, the Indians, I mean, right now, Bieber and then Plesak and Savali, Savali yeah. and Plutko and Jeffrey Rodriguez. Yeah. If the season were it had to start today, it would be your, your starting five because yeah. you traded Kluber, you traded Bauer, uh, the, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Good, Goldilocks with the long hair. Uh, he's out for six to eight weeks in Clevenger, and now we don't know what's up with Carrasco. Hopefully it is just a baseball-related injury, D-man, and not something that he was battling last year you know, with, with the cancer and everything. That, that's what I'm keeping my fingers crossed to hear he pulled a hamstring or he tweaked a muscle or something. That's what I'm hoping to hear whenever the, the results come out. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate for the Indians, uh, but there is maybe a silver lining in that Clevenger believes that his injury is relatively speaking, you know, it's always easy for us to say on the outside, minor. Uh, he's, you know, he doesn't think it's going to – hurt him too much uh, and it could have been worse it could have been an ACL so uh, the prognosis on Clevenger is good I agree with you it's nerve-wracking anytime Carrasco is involved in a yep. injury situation or whatnot you can't help but wonder you know what is that body going through so you you pray for the man first the person the family man and then of course, absolutely the yeah. Uh, but the good news for Cleveland is they have some pitching depth. It's it's obviously being tested right out of the chute before you even played a preseason game, uh, an exhibition game. It's already being tested. But, uh, you know, last year I liked what I saw from Plesak. I liked what I saw from Savale. Uh, Pletko was in and out. Rodriguez you didn't see enough of, but he's got some some filthy stuff when he's right. Uh, Logan Allen is another one who could potentially help him. So, you, you know this, with Frank Kona, it's no excuses. It's next man up. I've never heard that guy bellyache about injuries or woe is I, woe is us. He's never done that. So, um, you know, he's just going to be like, hey, I'm going to hand the ball to whoever's healthy and let's go, uh, go to work. The problem is this division figures to be a three-horse race. Uh, I think the White Sox are going to join the party this year uh, with the Twins and the Indians. And, uh, you know, the Indians' strength over those other two teams was their starting pitching. And when healthy, still is. But if it's dinged, if the rotation's dinged, then all of a sudden their advantage over the White Sox and the Twins is mitigated greatly. And then you look at the lineups – and all of a sudden the Twins lineup is better than Cleveland's and the White Sox lineup is better than Cleveland's. And you go, all right, well, we don't have the advantage we had in the rotation. So uh, it brings us back to the pack a little bit in terms of that three-horse race. But I will say this, I'm, I'm fascinated by the Central this year. I think, uh, you know, I look around baseball and I get that it doesn't have a salary cap, but I like the relative – amount of parity in the game because when I looked at it I say okay there's 30 teams I said 15 of them legitimately can talk about a division title or at the very least a uh, a wild card so that's half the league 
That's always the goal of a professional league. Have half, at least half your teams legitimately contenders. And I looked at, and I went down each team and I said, 15 without question can say they have a, a, an ability to compete. Another five are, could be sneaky good. You know, okay. a, a team like the Boston Red Sox, a team like the Texas Rangers. You never know with their retooling. And obviously people think the Red Sox are going to take some really precipitous fall. But you can also argue that they underachieved so woefully last year that maybe they're going to return to prominence this year, even without Mookie uh, and David Price. So I, I had them in a group of five, as well as Texas, and, and, and I can't remember the other teams off the top of my head. So that's 20 out of 30 that you could make a case for being a playoff contender. Then there was another five that are young and probably going to lose more than they win, but they're going to be fun to watch on certain nights because of the prospects that they have. I think of a team like the, uh, the Marlins, and I know some people would put the Marlins in my last basket, which is five terrible teams. I, I said five out of the 30 are absolutely terrible, including two in the AL Central, the Tigers and the Royals. Right. I didn't put the, the, the Marlins in the terrible group. I put them in the fun-to-watch, lovable loser group, which included five teams, because I think the Marlins have a lot of prospects uh, that are going to start to see playing time. The point is, even without a cap, if two-thirds of your league or association – is playoff viable, that's a good thing. And so I'm excited for MLB. I mean, look at the NL Central, the big old pig pile now that the NL Central is. Pittsburgh, one of the terrible teams. But other than that, the Reds, the Cubs, the Brewers, all going to be uh, fighting and scrapping and, and battling, I think, and the Cardinals. You, I, you're looking at four out of five teams in that division fighting for a playoff spot. In the AL West, you have the, the Astros, the Disastros, and you have the, the uh, Angels with Joe Madden and the Athletics who made the wild card last year and the potentially sneaky good Rangers. In the East, you've got the Yankees, the Rays, and then potentially the Red Sox. One of my teams in the five fun-to-watch category are the Blue Jays because – I don't think they're going to win more than they lose, but they're going to be fun to watch because of those young prospects they have. So the state of the game to me is good, even in light of the horrendous, horrific cheating scandal with which uh, the league is resting right now. And the buffoon that's in charge of it, Rob Manfred, who's the worst commissioner in all of sports and should be fired or he should resign with his handling of the uh, the Houston Astros cheating scandal. It's, it's an absolute joke, and I love that the players are speaking out like they're speaking out because uh, he did absolutely nothing to penalize the players or the Astros. Don't give me the draft picks. Don't give me the $5 million. That's 20 bucks to those uh, guys that own baseball teams that are billionaires, right? That's nothing. So Rob Manfred, to me, and then his comments about just a piece of metal uh, with the, the, the World Championship trophy and everything like that, uh, I, I think he should resign. I think he did a horrible job in not penalizing them. I'm waiting to see what he doesn't do to the Boston Red Sox also uh, when, when the findings come in and, and when they announce that. So uh, yeah. that, that pisses me off. I, that got me all fired up. Uh, the Indians got swept by those Astros. You, you look at the differences, home and away, with their stats. And, and if you're the if you're the Yankees, you should be pissed. If you're the Dodgers, you should be pissed. Uh, it's just Rob Manford dropped the ball big time. He has no balls whatsoever. He should have taken a page out of Roger Goodell's notebook and been judge, jury, and executioner, and made them fight suspensions. Uh, you know, if he handed them down or made the, the Astros fight for being allowed to play in the postseason this year and next year when I think they shouldn't be, and he could have at least handed that penalty down to the, the cheating Astros. Yeah, and it amazes me that with all the money that is available uh, in the coffers of MLB, it seems like they have Keystone Cops as investigators. I mean, the fact that you have to grant full immunity to these Astros cheating players just to get the answers that you want Yep. Uh, that that's confounding to me. The fact that you, the investigation, and I use that term loosely, I put it in air quotes 
of the Red Sox in 18 has taken this long. What's taking you so long? I, I don't get that. How could you not have, have come to some conclusion about the 18 Red Sox a month ago, two months ago? So it is ridiculous, and, and it, it is a black eye for the game. And I agree with you, Manfred should have resigned. For the good of the game, he should have uh, tapped out. Like it he, happened under his watch. He should have pulled a beeline and tapped out. There you go. Um, he, yeah. And and there's also the disturbing element well, of many disturbing elements, the idea that players are saying that they the alarm was sounded about the Astros cheating. It was sent to New York. Yep. And the MLB basically said nothing to see here. And then only until fires yep. uh, came out in the athletic did, did MLB actually act and start investigating. So that's malfeasance in and of itself because the players before fires, before the celebrated whistleblowing of Mike Fires, they were sounding the alarm that the Astros were up to no good, that they were defying Manfred's orders in the wake of the Apple Watch scandal with the Red Sox. And MLB did nothing about it. Only when they were publicly uh, called out by fires did they, oh, 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 I guess we have to get onto this investigation. And, and, and another thing that really bothers me is Dusty Baker, the new manager of the Astros. I don't blame him for doing it when he says, hey, I'm new to this whole thing. I didn't cheat. I want my guys protected from retaliation. He tells that to MLB. I don't blame Baker for doing that. I blame MLB for even responding to that. Yes. Because MLB comes out and says, you know what, Dusty? You're right. We're going to tell every team you can't retaliate against the Astros hitters. The ML, MLB, MLB offices, Manfred and his crew, should have just said nothing. They shouldn't have even acknowledged what Dusty Baker said. Because now what you're doing is you're actually rewarding the cheaters going forward because Astros hitters can dig in, and if they get hit, all of a sudden the pitcher's going to may, may get warned or ejected. I mean, I can be a pitcher who throws hard, and I go up against the Astros at Minute Maid Park, and I might not be thinking one second about the cheating scandal. But I want to back Alex Bregman off the plate a little bit. So I come in with a 96-mile-an-hour heater, and I hit him in the ribs. You're going to tell me the umpire is automatically going to warn me in the first inning? When I had no – I wasn't doing anything related to the cheating scandal. I was just trying to move a batter off the plate. Now all of a sudden I'm getting a warning, and the Astros hitters – can eliminate the inside half of the plate because I can't go in there because if I hit him again, I'm ejected. Yep. That is completely, utterly, patently unfair to all of these teams who are facing the Astros. So what Manfred has done by responding to Baker's pleas is he has given the Astros, the cheaters, the benefit of the doubt, and he's given them Again. A better a better opportunity in the batter's box than everybody yeah. else has. Yeah, again. So that that's why I say he should resign. He's an embarrassment to the game. It's history. Uh, and uh, you know they talk all about Pete Rose and the steroid era and all that. To me, Rob Manford, what he's done or not done uh, is as bad, if not worse. And I'll just, D-Man, we could talk for another hour on this topic. I'm so pissed off and fired up. I want to go read this story for my show tomorrow. Jonathan Lucroy says he was changing signs every pitch when they went against the Astros when he played against them. So I need to read this story to get me even more pissed off yeah. so I won't sleep. And, and I know we've gone late, and we'll wrap it up here because uh, Chase has got, uh, you know, his his his, uh, his new family, his burgeoning family to attend to, and Roadman's got a big show tomorrow. But I, let me say this, too. Mike Fires is a hero. I don't want to hear any criticism of Mike Fires. Any of you out there, uh, certainly uh, potentially in Houston, who have threatened Mike Fires, you should be ashamed of yourselves. 
It's disgusting. Mike Fires did baseball a huge service. As you can tell by all of the players who have come out of the woodwork since his revelation. And I'm going to take the task of future Hall of Famer by the name of David Ortiz. Speak, preach. Go ahead. What are you doing, David O? What are you doing, Big Poppy? Saying you don't appreciate the fact that uh, Fires snitched. What are you talking about, Ortiz? Mike Fires did what the commissioner didn't have the guts to do. He shined the light on the worst cheating scandal, perhaps in the history of the game. He should be, he is a hero. Okay. David Ortiz, shut your pie hole. You, you are way, way, way off base on this issue. You owe fires an apology for coming out with your crappy comments about how fires is a snitch. Hell to the no. If if you hadn't seen the avalanche of criticism directed toward the Astros from around the league, then maybe you'd think, well, maybe fire stepped over the line a little bit. But guess what? Everybody in MLB has fires back. So how can he be a snitch if everybody's echoing his sentiments? He's not a snitch. He's a hero. So shut up, Big Poppy. Okay. I don't need to say anything else about that because I agree with everything you said about Big Poppy. And I like Big Poppy, but – So do uh, I. Yeah. Uh, Except he, there. He, he, he's completely 100% wrong. And don't forget, D-Man, uh, you know, back in the day of the steroid era, allegedly he was one of the guys, one of the hundred tested by Major League Baseball in that era and tested positive but was never uh, – nothing was ever done to him. So maybe that has something to do with his his approach to his comments, plus the Red Sox, the team that he won the championships for, their punishment still hasn't been handed down. And, and uh, you know, so maybe he's tied in. With, I don't know. Don't even get, just end this thing because we, like I said, we'd be up until four in the morning talking about this baseball scandal because of the idiot Rob Manfred. Roadman, thank you so much for the time. And, uh, you know, we, we gave the, the listeners everything we had. We emptied, uh, emptied the tank and hopefully uh, – Chase can make it sound even better, uh, but take care. Have a good trip out to uh, Arizona. We'll hit you when uh, when you come back. Yeah, follow me on Twitter at the Kenny Rota, uh, 1480WHBC.com. You can listen. We'll do the shows live every day from out there. We'll talk to Terry Francona every day. Frankie Lindor, we didn't even touch on that, his contract situation. I'm going to be all over that while we're out there as well, D-Man. So uh, you can follow it uh, on social media while we're out in Arizona. Can't wait. 